Hello, Manufacturing World. I'm Wade Anderson with Shop Matters, sponsored by Akuma America. This podcast is created to discuss all things machining and manufacturing. Some great guests with us. I'm joined by LNS. We've got Ron Parker. Hi, Wade. Glad to be here. And we've got Randy Lewis. Wade, thanks for having us here. So we're going to talk about everything you need to know about high-pressure coolant and advanced connectivity for machine tools and peripheral equipment. Randy, tell us a little bit about what you do with LNS. Well, I've been with LNS for almost 33 years now. Uh, you know, so when I started out with the company, 33 years. 33 years. So eventually, they're going to actually offer you a full-time position. They might. They might. That's that's. I'm I'm still like in the probationary period. But, you know, some somewhere I'm going to hit that full-time status, hopefully. But no, I you know I started out many years ago in our service group. Spent ten about ten years there, and then slowly moved up through the ranks. And now I mainly handle all the uh, connectivity development using the Think platform. Uh, also, I take care of any, any connectivity between machines, whether it be some type in advanced or hardwiring type connectivity Fantastic. applications. They asked me to sweep the floor. I'm on board with it. Hey, I'm glad to go. sweep the floor. Now you get into my, into my world. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ron, tell us a little bit about you. Well, I uh, presently with uh, with LNS, I'm the national product manager for uh, high pressure coolant systems. So I I get to uh, work with the sales guys and all of our customers and, and teach them and help them with uh, improving their processes by using high pressure coolant. All right. So I'm familiar with LNS. I've worked with LNS for a long time. Uh, I used to work with turbo uh, chip conveyors back right. before it was LNS turbo. Um, and then uh, obviously we do a lot with LNS on bar feeders and steady rest. Uh, but IMTS was pretty exciting for you guys. You guys have something uh, something new that came about with the LNS product line? Yeah, and uh, uh, IMTS uh, uh, was the time frame where uh, LNS purchased uh, a chip blaster. Uh, so as a former chip blaster employee of 18 years, I now get to wear an LNS shirt and uh, have joined that team and bring all of the uh, knowledge that chip blaster has to the table to, uh, to help the one-stop shop that uh, LNS provides to their customers. All right, so let's uh, let's dive right into high pressure coolant. Uh, tell us a little bit about high pressure coolant. When we say that term, uh, we use that a lot internally. We'll talk about high pressure coolant, and sometimes we mean high pressure is two hundred psi. Sometimes we mean three hundred psi. Sometimes we mean more. So, in your world, if I say the statement LNS is working with chip blaster, they're doing high pressure coolant. What does that mean for a customer? Well, high pressure coolant in our world means uh, 1,000 psi or 70 bar. Uh, that's the amount of pressure that it requires to break through this uh, vapor barrier that forms when you cut metal. All right. So tell me a little bit more about that. So the vapor barrier that forms when you cut metal, what does 1,000 psi do from that aspect? Well, basically when you're cutting metal, you're getting temperatures that are extremely hot. Uh, water boils at 212 degrees, as we know. So it, once your metal or your cutting tools over uh, that temperature, the water boils. So uh, when you flood the, the, the part, uh, the water boils away and forms a vapor of, of uh, uh, vapor barrier. So the coolant can't actually penetrate to the tip of the tool. A thousand PSI is the amount of force that it actually takes through a nozzle of the coolant stream to actually hit the tip of the insert. And at that point, it takes the heat out of the process and uh, you can now make better chips and your tools last longer and the proof is in the fact that the chips don't turn blue anymore. Okay. So does that change from material to material? The 1,000 PSI is good for any material that's out there. It actually makes uh, many materials cut similar to one another. So an aluminum will not gum up on your cutter anymore. It'll cut like a steel, and uh, uh, even materials like ink and titanium uh, benefit from 1,000 PSI. So one of these days, somebody's going to throw a piece of paper at me or something every time I bring this up. But I come from a grinder background. So a lot of my references, when I think back to making chips, making parts, my brain automatically goes into to kind of grinder mode. So in grinders, we had a, uh, a process that we used uh, specifically to try to match the surface footage of the wheel. But we also needed amount of volume. Um, so we can match the surface footage of the wheel. But if we weren't getting enough volume, we would still have problems with our process. How important is that? What do you see in, when you're doing chip cutting, machining, turning? How much of it is pressure related? How much of it is volume related? That's actually a very good question. Uh, uh, pressure without volume actually is meaningless. So um, you can have a, a thousand PSI, but if it's only two gallons a minute, there's not enough force at the, at the cutting edge. So uh, we have a rule of thumb to, to make it real simple for, for, for guys like me. Um, so uh, we use a rule of thumb of 10 gallons of coolant 
uh, at 1,000 PSI per inch of tool diameter. So if you're drilling a hole, for example, with a one-inch drill, you need 10 gallons of coolant. Uh, if you have a half-inch drill, you need five gallons of coolant. Uh, it, it simply works that way. Okay. Uh, what are some of the benefits that a customer would expect to uh, receive from using high-pressure coolant? The benefits are uh, better productivity. Um, uh, they're they're going to get uh, uh, better chip formation because a, a, the high-pressure coolant pulling the heat out of the process actually is going to uh, cause the chip to curl because a cold chip will actually curl and break, whereas a, a hot chip is was, was more stringy and, and tends to... Uh, to, to cause a bird's nest. So smaller chip formation and then uh, longer tool life because the chips aren't sitting there beating up the insert and the, and the tools. So we've been talking a lot about automation here in the past couple of podcasts. I look at what you just said that instantly connected in my mind about automation because I can't automate a process if I've got uncontrolled chips. So if I've got a process where I'm cutting parts and every 15th part, I wind up with a bird nest of, of chips, I can't really automate that process because I don't have a controlled uh, set of parameters at that point. So you're saying high pressure coolant would help me from that aspect because I'm, I'm going to get better chip control? Correct. That's actually one of the one of the huge benefits. We get calls from customers all the time that want to uh, automate their process. Uh, you, you can't have a robot changing parts if there's chips wrapped around it. It's not going to be able to grab the part. So uh, by managing the chips uh, more effectively, we can we can uh, enable the customer then to have a, a robot, for example, and to automate and be able to pull that part out of the machine without chips being in the way. So at, on my showroom floor currently in, in Charlotte uh, at our Partners and Think facility, I've got an LB3000 and we've got a chip blaster unit tied to it. That unit's a variable pressure unit. Why is that important? Tell me a little bit about that and where would we use that? A variable pressure is good for from a standpoint of... Uh, uh, many customers uh, use uh, use live driven tools, and uh, some some live tools are, are not capable of a thousand psi, uh, so they may want to turn the pressure down, and our unit will do that automatically through the control. So if they need 300 psi for a particular tool, they just they just change the parameter, and the unit automatically will slow down, and still maintain full volume, but at that pressure. Um, in addition, if a customer was uh, machining a part that had a very thin wall, that uh, perhaps a thousand psi could uh, deform that part. They could turn the pressure down on some of the final passes and actually uh, make a better uh, tolerance part. So how does the unit change the, the pressures? Is that done, is that a, a servo-driven pump? What, what does that look like? It, it all works basically with a, uh, a transducer is, is mounted on the external coolant line, which monitors the pressure. And then that feeds to a PLC or a little con a computer that tells a drive to speed up or slow down the motor. So basically, uh, and, and it'll change automatically. So if you change tools, it'll still maintain the same pressure for a larger tool or a smaller tool. And it, it sees the flow and the pressure and it and speeds up and slows down, just like the gas pedal on your car. All right. So, Randy, I'm going to shift the conversation over to you now. As we're oh, talking no. about communication, <laughs> we're talking variable pressures, we're talking communicating from a, a LNS chip blaster unit to the OSP control. Right. What are the advantages that you see working with uh, what you're doing on the LNS side versus what we do on the Akuma side? So just kind of touch a little bit on Ron, what Ron said there at the end about the variable pressure. <clears throat> so on a standard unit you know, that we have currently, to do variable pressure with a system, most systems out there will have a set point. And maybe you have multiple set points, which you would actually have to set on the high-pressure system itself. Now what we've done, leveraging the Think API, is that we're actually able to do that now programmatically. So by simply using a common variable on the machine tool, any pressure that we write or a value that we write to that common variable automatically gets sent to the high pressure system, thus automatically adjusting to that pressure. So if we wanted to run 100 PSI, you'd simply in your program, maybe after a tool change, write the value of 100 to a specific common variable, that's what it would run at. If you switch tools and you needed a higher pressure, maybe 1,000 PSI, you can now write that value into that same variable, and that's what it would automatically run at. So it, it's a nice feature because your pressures are saved in your cutting programs. They're not saved on the unit, which means there could be manual intervention required. So now we, we've automated that process. So from switching from part to part, there's no need to interact with the high-pressure system itself. Your cutting program will take care of that automatically. Excellent. Now, you just said something. I just jotted a quick note down. Um, at Akuma, we use a lot of acronyms, and, and we'll throw 
terms, ter- terminology out there that uh, sometimes we understand internally, we don't always understand outside. Um, you said the word API. Right. Now, obviously, I know what an API is from from uh, my years at uh, in this line of work. But when we first started talking about that, two thousand four, two thousand five timeframe API, the question: was, What in the world's yeah, an API? Yeah, you get that a lot. Yeah. So explain that. If there's people out there like me, I'm a chip cutter. My strong suit is not right. talking connectivity. What is API? What does that mean? Right. So an API, you know, it stands for Advanced Programming Interface. It's it's just a program that we have written that installs on the Akuma control. It's it's definition by name is an API. So it's it's no different than any other program. If you had installed Microsoft Office on your computer, basically the same thing. Okay. So it's what's kind of communicating back and forth from one device to the other device. Exactly right. It manages it manages the uh, yeah the communication between our product and the OSP side. Okay. I always like to think of it in terms of, of conduit. You know, I walk into a room, I flip the light switch on, I got the conduit that's running from that switch that's carrying the cable up to that light, and uh, the API is kind of what's doing that conduit from one device exactly. to the other device. Exactly. Excellent. So tell us a little bit more about uh, connectivity. Um, why is it important for somebody to have con- connected devices, and what are you seeing that's changing in, in our market and in, in the world that we're living in today? Yeah, so the world, it's, it's changing fast, right? You know, some of the technology that we're using, it's really not so new. It's just that it's newer for the machine tool market, and it's taken a little bit of time to take hold. So IoT versus IIoT. Yeah, you know, that there's a lot of acronyms out there. Uh, they all have a specific field that they focus on, but also are, can be used interchangeably for the most part. So IoT, IIoT, Industry 4.0. Mm-hmm. From our sense, it's the same. So generally speaking, what is IIoT and Industry 4.0? What does that mean if I'm if I'm a customer? I've got a machine shop. I've got 10 machines, and I want to understand more about this and, and how to get more efficient. What is Industry 4.0, IIoT? What does that mean to them? So IIoT and Industry 4.0 are essentially the exact same thing. Industry 4.0 is a European phrase for it. They got started with the German government really pushing that. IIoT is more of an American phrase. Uh, it's for industrial Internet of Things. Mm-hmm. So Industry 4.0, IIoT, exact same things based on industrial needs. IoT is more of a consumer base. Your doorbell, Wi-Fi doorbell, cell phones talking to each other, things like that. Okay. So right now we've got uh, the, the machine I mentioned before, Partners and Think. I almost call that the LNS machine. So we've got an LB3000, we've got a LNS bar feeder on one end, we've got a LNS chip conveyor on the other end, we've got a chip blaster unit, we've got a miscollection unit. All that is connected, right? Yes. Why does that matter to me? Why do I care? So what we've done, and this is the first time that this has been done, I, I think to have that many peripheral devices all communicating not only with one another, but communicating with the machine tool also. I'll take the bar feeder for example. In days past, you know, you're running material out of there, and it, eventually you consume that bar stock that you're running. In days past, we could say that, yes, you have material to run or you don't have, but the machine tool never knew exactly how much. It just knew it didn't have enough material. With the Think Platform, what we're able to do now is we can actually send you the value. So instead of saying yes or no, we can tell you you have 35 inches of material left. Now the machine can start making some very intelligent decisions about how it wants to process that part, or if you've got multiple parts scheduled, how it's going to run those parts most efficiently. All right, so I'm a big fan of of commonality. So when I'm making parts, I'm trying to to look at how, how do I reduce my changeover? How do I get more productive with the setup that I've currently got? Typically speaking, and I'm saying a broad brush stroke, but I can make chips faster than I can be taking work holding off a machine and and tooling and changing things over. So I like to look at bar stock. I tend to want to go as big a diameter as I can to get the most opportunities to make multiple types of parts out of that. So what you're saying, based on the communication and the connectivity going from your system to the OSP system, as a programmer, I could write a schedule program that is basically, I'm just picturing a if-then go-to type statement Mm -hmm. from a parametric standpoint to say, if I've got X amount of bar stock, call up this program, make these parts, because the 
I've got a longer blank, but then when I get down to a smaller length of bar stock, now my if then go to could be saying, okay, if this bar is short, call up this program because you've got enough material to make five of these smaller parts to maximize what what material I've got in. Is that am I on the right track? It is, yeah. So the 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 whole point of it is that you're going to be able to write a scheduled data file on your machine. And for instance, you can say today I need five of these, maybe I need a hundred of these and twenty of these parts. So you'll you'll set up those parts in your scheduled data file. And there's two pieces of criteria that we need to look at before we determine which part we're going to run. First we have to determine do we have a quantity of that part left to run? If we don't, it's going to jump over that part. It's going to say, I'm finished with it. It's going to go evaluate the next part. Mm -hmm. If we do have a quantity of it to run, then we're going to look at, do I have enough material? That's where the, the data that we're sending the machine tool comes into play because I'm now telling you exactly how much you have. You have to make sure that that value is greater than your part length. And as long as you have a quantity to make and we have enough material, then it will then call that cutting program. And it will just keep cycling through until either I don't have a quantity to make or I don't have enough material to make that part. So if I had a 6-inch part, a 3-inch part, and a 1-inch part that I wanted to run, and I'm reporting back that I only have 5 and 3 quarters inch material, I know I can't run that first part because I don't have enough. Mm -hmm. But it will then evaluate that second part, and it will say, hey, here's a 3-inch part. It's going to head and call that part. So now we've got our remnant down to a smaller length. If I get down to where I don't have enough to make that, it's going to run down and jump down and run my smaller part. So now I've, what I've done is I've taken this remnant that could possibly be very long, and I'm going to reduce it down to the minimal length that it could possibly be. You know, you're running expensive material. It, it adds up to be a lot. Right. Get the most out of it. Yep. So the connectivity side of it, is this, uh, what protocol are you using? Is this an MT Connect platform? So there are actually several protocols All right. being run. <laughs> so that's, that's the nice thing. You know, when, we, when we, we interface with the Yakuma machine, there's two different methods of communicating. Okay. So when we're, we're talking about a bar feeder, there are signals that are discrete. So you have standard I.O. signals that are being communicated. Those cannot be sent through the Think platform. Mm -hmm. So there is actually a converter in there that those types of signals get through. Those are bits. They're ons and they're offs, things right. like that. So that's a, that's a different protocol. You're coming out of your machine with the vice net. We're converting it to Modbus TCP so that the bar feeder can understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, the Think API, where, you know, they're HTTP protocols that we're using. Um, so and that's where you're getting your graphical interface, basically, exactly. right? That people are going to be going in and, and human interfacing. With. Right. And then MT Connect is a protocol of itself. So we're running three different protocols simultaneously on that machine. Okay. So the eConnect, uh, we're showing a lot of your devices now currently on Akuma Smart Factory. Right. Um, that could go on to Fanuc Field or Freedom, E-Log, anything like that. Yeah. Um, when, when we're looking at that, what, what are benefits of that to a customer? I think that's the million-dollar question people have. There's all these OEE-type software uh, platforms available. We've got our own. fanix has got their – everybody's got a, a version of it. What do you do with it? That's, that's the biggest phone call I get. Uh, you know, hey, I'm looking at whatever platform, and how do I get a return on that investment? Why, right. why would I make that visual and what does that do for me? Right. So there's, there's two, there's two parts to the, the e-connect or to the advanced connectivity. You have two paths to go down. You can do machine to machine communication where we can actually take the whole process to a higher level of automation, or we can do the data collection, what you're referring to about either connecting to uh, the Akuma connect plan software or Freedom Software, either one. There's there's many packages mm -hmm. out there. But we'll be sending the types of data that we'll be sending to that would be over an MT Connect format. From there, you can start doing lots of analytics, collecting data, uptown, uptime, downtime. Uh, on the Akuma side, you know, you're looking at spindle speeds. You're able to do predictive maintenance. So a lot of different things like that that you can do by gathering that information over a period of time. Okay. 
Now that dovetails back in. I'm going to flip the conversation back over to Ron here. Um, he just mentioned about uh, predictive maintenance. Um, that's a big issue for me. If I'm a machine shop owner and I'm trying to get my overall efficiencies up and I'm trying to maximize my spindle utilization, last thing I need to be doing is shutting a machine down mid-process, whether it's manual loaded or automated, and pulling chip conveyors out and trying to clean out sludge out of a coolant tank. How are you guys addressing that from a filtration standpoint? Well, we've got some uh, exciting new new filtration items out uh, um uh, our, our cyclonic filter is something we've been working on for a couple years, and uh, uh, it's actually a, a cyclonic filter that uh, uh, we, we studied the market, and uh, cyclonic f- filtration is nothing new. It's been out for years, but we have uh, uh, actually uh, engineered uh, a, a better cyclone than anything that's out there. It's made on CNC equipment, and uh, uh, it's, it's uh, the interior passageways are, are all, all polished, and we've been able to eliminate uh, pulsations and we're, we're able to basically take a cyclone, which has no moving parts other than the pump that pumps the coolant through it, and get filtration down to 2 micron with efficiencies up around 95%. Wow. All right. So back in my previous life, when I first got into machining, uh, actually the very first chip I ever cut in my uh, entire life was on an old Akuma LB15. Um, it was at a turbocharger manufacturer. I'll leave the, the name out of it. I don't know if I can say that over a podcast or not, but... Um, but one of the worst jobs that I ever had was on the horizontal machining centers. About every three or four months, we would have to pull a, the coolant tank apart, and I would literally have to chisel out the, the cast iron sludge that basically set up like concrete in that thing. And you talk about dirty, nasty, slimy work. Does the cyclonic filtration, would that help from that aspect? Oh, it's, 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 it's like magic. It's like night and day. I mean, we have... Uh, uh, that's really what we designed it for. Customers coming to us saying, there's got to be something better than bag filters. Um, many of our, uh, our cast iron customers were literally changing their bag filters every eight hours. So if they're running three shifts a day, that's three times a day they have to shut down and change a bag filter. And so that's why we designed the Cyclone. And, and yeah, it, it, it eliminates the bag filter. So there's no, no bag filters, no cartridge filters, no paper band media. Um, the Cyclone runs by itself. And uh, uh, we pull that sludge out of the tank, and we, we deposit it into a separate holding holding tank. Uh, and, and so uh, your your sump on your machine tool, um, uh, actually, even with cast iron, can still uh, have clean coolant, uh, a nice yellow or white colored coolant. Uh, your sludge, your your uh, your sump does not have to be uh, dirty looking if you're machining cast iron. We can actually clean that to look like it's brand new coolant all the time. Okay. So if I'm say I'm a machine shop, I've got. 25 machines all in a row um and i've got a critical path i've got 25 machines and out of these 25 i've got five that i got to make sure they don't go down we've got tight production we've got tight uh, goals that we've got to hit what what am i using from lns that's going to help me make sure that the akuma is communicated it's visual and we can monitor when this downtime could occur and try to get ahead of that game. Yeah, so that's where the Connect plan really comes in or any other third-party package that you want to do for monitoring. We can also not only tie that into the chip the chip conveyor, not the chip conveyor, the high-pressure system, I'm sorry. We, we offer too many products. <laughs> <laughs> but the high-pressure coolant system. Talk about a lot of products. Look at our product, Brett, yeah, I one know, time. It's crazy, have a customer it? ask you, hey, what's the spindle nose on a, you know, whatever machine? And, right. You know, one platform can be configured 71 different right. ways. You think I can remember all yeah. that off the top of my head? But you tie that in along with our uh, air filtration systems. Mm-hmm. So there's filters in the high pressure system. There's two or three filters in a mist collector. Okay. So are those visible? Can I see what those filters are, are doing from you can from see the them? There's, so there's a mechanical gauge. Okay. Right? So we've also taken with our eConnect platform, we've digitized that data now, and we can expose that out to the Akuma Connect plan. So you take that along with the high pressure. You know, you could have 25, 50 units. The mist collectors, we have customers that have more than 100 of them. So how do you even monitor that? How do you set up preventative maintenance on that? So by us being able to digitalize the pressures and exposing that data to the connect plan, now that can all be monitored from a single dashboard. So somebody's not spending all their time walking around inspecting machines. Somebody can just sit in front of a monitor and evaluate all that. So if I'm the manufacturing engineer, the production engineer, that's my dashboard. I can see what's going on and I can say, okay, these five machines I've set aside that I that I want to make sure that they don't go down in the middle of the night unexpectedly. 
I can be monitoring that and seeing, okay, my, my filtration level is getting to a certain point. I need to schedule maintenance to go in, change that out at seven o'clock in the morning. Exactly. On Thursday. Yeah. So okay. we'll, we'll tell you if the filter is good, if it's in a warning state or if it's exceeded its use. So you know, once in the warning state there, you can just take and set up a schedule for when you want to have the machine down. All right. Excellent. As we bring this to a close, is there any new products? You know, maybe it's not to market right now today, but what does three, five years down the road look like? Um, any Anything new and exciting from LNS that's coming down the pipeline? Well, Wade, we actually uh, are working on a project right now uh, that's going to tie in with our cyclone filtration. Uh, it would be a, an air removal device. So a lot of customers out there have foaming issues with their coolant. And uh, they always blame the, the high-pressure coolant guys, right? So we're, we're going to solve that problem. So we're working on a device that will uh, piggyback with our cyclone filtration that will actually remove the air uh, as it passes through our cyclonic devices. So it's in testing phases now, and you'll probably see that within the next year or so. Fantastic. Always innovating. All right. Well, guys, I appreciate your time today. Appreciate you joining us here. And as always, if anybody in our listening audience has questions or things that they topics that they want to hear us talk about, Please send them in. We're, we're glad to glad to go through them and uh, and come up with solutions for you. My name's Wade Anderson, and we'll see you next time. Bye.